This conference will now be recorded. So hi, welcome everybody. This is Rick Davis and um, this is a fifth Monday. Uh, so we're not holding one of our usual um, uh, support group meetings. Um, this is a, uh, a special meeting and we are delighted to welcome um, one of the members of our, of our advisory board, um, Dr. Richard Wassersud, PhD, who um, many of you know by name, you may not have seen him before, so you'll enjoy that. Um, Richard is the author of, um, of this book, which I'm holding up to the camera, which is Androgen Deprivation Therapy, an essential guide for prostate cancer patients and their loved ones. And um, he is um, indeed an expert on hormone therapy, having uh, been on it for plus or minus 20 years, he'll tell you exactly. But it isn't just any old hormone therapy that Richard's been on. He has been on um, estrogen-based hormone therapy um, I believe for most all of that time. And um, so in recent weeks, because this subject of estrogen-based hormone therapy came up a number of times, um, some of the guys in the group said, well, we would really like to have a whole session on this. And I reached out to Richard and he very kindly agreed to talk to us tonight. And so this will not be a regular support group meeting. We're not going to ask people who need time. Um, what we are going to do is, is ask you to listen um, carefully to, to Richard, who's going to present for 20 minutes, half an hour. I'm not exactly sure however long he, he wishes to present. And then we're going to have a discussion and back and forth um, now, to do that, because of the number of people, we'd like to ask you all, if possible, to use the chat window. Um, the chat window, for those of you who are not used to being on GoToMeeting, is the little white bubble in the top right-hand corner of the speech bubble. And um, Herb and Len are going to monitor that. Um, and if you want a, if, a, if you have a question, um, or you need clarification from Richard, just please put a note in there. Um, we will hold the, the more, um, uh, I don't want to say advanced, but, but the, the more original questions till the end. Um, but if you need clarification, please let us know. Uh, Richard's kindly agreed to, to stop along the way at any point if, if, if something isn't clear. Um, so, uh, and I will ask everybody to mute, please, um, with the exception of the moderators and, and Richard. Um, so if you, are, um, if you are joining us and on GoToMeeting, please just click the little green microphone at the bottom um, it is important if, if we do hear background noise, we will have to jump in and mute you. So we, we, we ask you to mute yourselves if that's at all possible. Um, and with that said, I am going to turn the meeting over to, um, to Dr. Wasasu and to get us going. Oh, I'm getting really weird feedback there. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming uh, to, to this presentation. Uh, this is going to be unusually informal. Uh, I've, I spent my career as a professor of anatomy and neurobiology at Dalhousie University in Halifax, and I'm hearing a huge amount of background noise, enormous amount, like a helicopter going by. Can you, can you hear me? There we go. Whoever got muted, please. Richard, thank it you. seems a lot of it. All right, we'll see. Well, it seems to have disappeared. Okay, so what, what I don't normally do is uh, present my sort of uh, uh, prostate cancer history when I give presentations other than to affirm that I am a patient. Uh, and I'll briefly cover that. Uh, but we're talking about my own personal treatments. Uh, and so I'm gonna give a bit of a personal history 
Uh, and a couple of key points are, are right off is that, yes, I, I am the lead author, and this is a second edition of the book on androgen deprivation therapy. This uh, book is endorsed by the Canadian Neurologic Association uh, because of its, it is evidence-based, purely evidence-based. We're getting that feedback again. I don't know where that's coming from. Oops. Um, I hope we, we don't get that again. Um, uh, it is also, there will be a third edition coming out from uh, as a European edition, which is really an international edition coming out this summer. And the reason I mentioned the book as a starting point, not that I'm trying to sell the book, but, but what I'm going to be talking about is my own personal treatment, which is off-label. That is to say, it is not uh, endorsed by the Canadian Urologic Association necessarily, nor by the European Association of Urology, which has supported the development of the third edition. So this is a personal story, and I'm not using it to promote uh, estradiol in any way personally. Uh, it is a, it's, it's my own, dis own approach, and I don't endorse it in the book. Uh, I, mention, I mention it. So as for the personal situation, um, I am, will be 57 years old next month. I was diagnosed almost uh, at exactly the same time of year uh, when I was 52 years old with an initial PSA of 19 um, and uh, had a, um, uh, a Gleason of, of, back then it was all of six cores, um, a Gleason of three, four, uh, but extra capsule extension, seminal vesicle involvement. And I'm guessing if they had done uh, the, the tw 10, 12 core, they would have found some four, three perhaps, but it but, but given that situation, I was a candidate for some prompt treatment. I had a radical prostatectomy. My PSA uh, kept on climbing. I then went within uh, a year for salvage radiotherapy, and my PSA kept climbing. Um, it was low, but, uh, but when my PSA was around um, 0.2, uh, it was clear and it was climbing uh, that I, I was a candidate for some sort of systemic treatment. Uh, and I went on Lupron. Uh, uh, I went from the care of an oncologist to the care of radiation oncologist. Uh, my oncologist, my radi my, me, urologist initially figured I had five or six years, but he, he reluctantly sent me off to see a, a rat onc. He figured I had five or six years. Uh, she was nice enough to say, Richard, you got to view this as a chronic disease. If we can keep you alive long enough, uh, there'll be better treatments. And that was uh, more than 20 years ago. <clears throat> So that's one theme that I think is important for me. However, I am a scientist first and foremost, uh, and I was did, did not like Lupron. Uh, I was on it for about uh, two years. Um, I also went on early Zometa uh, before that was a clinical trial, uh, and maybe have been some benefit at that time, but um, can't say. Uh, at this somewhere around two to three years into uh, Lupron standard. Uh, the drug for uh, ADT, for androgen deprivation therapy, uh, I was so frustrated by the side effects. Um, I could not do the computer games I like to play. Um, I realized, and in fact, I even lo lost my car in a large parking, parking lot in Florida and realized that I'm either getting senile or there's something going on here. Um, and I got into literature, uh, looked around, and realized there have been some review articles out of England, primarily led by a urologist named Paul Abel, looking at revisiting estrogen as a, a treatment for prostate cancer. Uh, and they had they'd done um, some looking at the older literature. And at, at this point, before I, I say that I, I essentially went on, on estrogen uh, in collaboration with the people in the UK, uh, I'm going to switch for a moment and give some history here. <clears throat> because using estrogen for uh, treating prostate cancer has an ugly history to it. And the history goes back to um, Charles Huggins. I know I sort of ask those who have a picture up, how many of you guys know the name Charles Huggins? No hands, two, three, four, a few hands. Okay, so Charles Huggins was a guy from Nova Scotia. Now, uh, and he, um, in fact, he's the only Nobel Prize winner ever from Nova Scotia. And I spent most of my career in, career in Nova Scotia teaching at Dalhousie University there. So uh, Huggins is something of a local hero. And he had realized uh, from literature and from his animals, with, uh, his work with animals, uh, that uh, testosterone was associated with enlarged uh, uh, prostate glands. 
And if you remove the testicles, and I knew this from, from castrating farm animals, uh, that they happen to have very small uh, prostates. And he came up with the idea of uh, reducing testosterone by what was available at that time, and this would have been the late 1940s, mid, mid to late 1940s, of castrating farm animals, uh, excuse me, castrating humans as they did farm animals. Uh, and I, I, I like to word this to point out to people that he's probably the only person that anybody ever got a Nobel Prize for castrating men, but he did. Uh, and, he, and it's usually said that way in a rather glib fashion. But in truth, he became the father of our understanding that certain cancers in both males and females were gonadal hormone dependent. So all of the work with, uh, with uh, aromatase inhibitors with breast cancer really starts with uh, Huggins realizing that he could uh, uh, alleviate the pain uh, of men who had advanced prostate cancer. And he couldn't cure it, but he could control it for some time. Uh, and it was worth a Nobel Prize, and I do believe it was. Um, now, but that was in the late 40s into the early 1950s. And as a, an aside on this aside, uh, Huggins went on to be a professor at the University of Chicago, where uh, Rick Davis got some training, and I did as well. And uh, before, long before I ever had uh, prostate cancer when I was a graduate student, I actually got to meet Huggins uh, back in the 1960s, late 1960s. So uh, castrating men, surgically castrating them, even to Huggins, was a, a little extreme. And it would have been nice if there was a drug that could do this. And it was clear that if you gave high dose estrogens, female hormones, you could shut off the mechanism that upregulated testosterone in men. And there was a cheap oral uh, drug called diethylstabesterol, diethyl DES. And DES uh, was uh, introduced as an oral castrating agent. So what it was a synthetic estrogen, uh, it would uh, uh, regulate the, uh, depress the, uh, the um, production of testosterone. And I will make an aside on an aside and go through a little bit about this pathway. So we know that the gonadal hormones, that is that the estrogens, progesterone from the ovaries, or the testosterone from the, the testicles, it gets into the circulatory system. If it goes to a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, it produces hormones that then signal to another part, the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland then can signal to the gonads. So you have this feedback loop. And if you have a high amount of gonadal hormone, it doesn't have to matter which one, uh, estrogen or testosterone, synthetic or natural, and they send the, the hypothalamus gets a lot of them, it sends a signal to the pituitary gland to shut the system down. So you can put feedback loops in here. Now, the LHRH drugs like uh, Zolidex, uh, Lupron, uh, as antagonists, as, as agonists, excuse me, put the system in overdrive and it shuts itself down. Or you can put, you go in with a uh, antagonist like a Degarolix, that's Fermagon, and shut it down. So there's a whole variety of ways you can interrupt this loop and shut it down, okay? And uh, DES did that very well. All right, and it's incredibly cheap. Now there's a problem here, <clears throat> and that is that about a, about um, one out of every twelve of these guys got uh, uh, blood clots, uh, thrombosis in their legs or wherever that migrated to the lungs and had pulmonary emboli, and they died of the uh, of the obstruction of the respiratory system. So DES was a bad drug, and around in the 1980s. Um, coming out of uh, Japan, they developed Lupron uh, with uh, Abbott Labs in, in, in con conjunction with Takata Labs produced uh, uh, Lupron as the first LHRH uh, ADT agent. And that's our prime, those are our primary ADT agents now. And everybody was happy with that because they, they were equally effective at suppressing testosterone and they did not seem to have the blood clot risk. And uh, that's where things were up until about uh, um, 20 years ago, well, 25 years ago, when some of the people in the UK, including Paul Abel primarily and his, uh, his colleagues, started revisiting uh, the issue of estrogens for controlling uh, the gonadal hormone levels. And what they realized, or they suspected, I would just say at that point, is that it wasn't the, the drugs that were the problem necessarily, but the pathway by which you were taking them. So I'm a professor of anatomy and I can tell you something that you may all know, but that everything you eat 
uh, is picked up by a circulatory system in your, your abdomen that carries the molecules that come into the circulatory system from the gut directly to the liver. And this is really a good thing because the liver does all sorts of enormous regulatory functions on, of its own. And in nature, a hell of a lot of plants which can't run away from predators like us produce toxins and the liver detoxifies. Unfortunately, the liver also makes uh, some of the blood clotting factors or as part of the processes for making blood clotting factors. So if you get a surge of estrogens to the liver, you can get an upregulation of blood clotting factors and get blood clots. Now you might wonder, well, wait a second, women have, have lots of estrogen, they eat lots of, you know, in their bodies normally, uh, but they have, they have a need for this because they go through menstrual, menstruation, menstruation and they don't want to bleed to death. So it's, a, it's to their advantage to have uh, at least uh, part of the month, uh, a clotting mechanism. However, for guys on high dose estrogen, so high that it shuts off gonadal hormone production, uh, this was dangerous. Uh, so the view that came out of this is, wait a second, why don't we go over to using transdermal estradiol? So it would be picked up slowly through the skin into the general, reg general circulatory system. It would not give you that surge that you'd get of estrogen right to the liver that you'd get if you took it orally. Non-oral drug um, administration is called parenteral administration. So this is a parenteral pathway. Because you could also inject it as another parenteral non-oral pathway. And some people in Europe looked into injectable estrogens in Scandinavia. And then the Europeans uh, in the UK started looking at transdermal estradiol. And at this point, I started communicating directly with Paul Abel, who was, by the way, uh, still alive, but is very disabled uh, from Parkinson's disease, um, which is sad because he's been a personal friend and a collaborator over these years. And I went to my oncologist after about two years, who had convinced me not to uh, uh, consider myself dead yet, but uh, think about other and better drugs along the way, and said, can we try this? So at that point, um, she said, okay, I'm willing to try it. Uh, and, uh, but we did not know how long it would take for me to, to get the estrogen up to effective levels while getting the Lupron down to an ineffective level. <clears throat> so we started taking blood tests uh, at once, a, once a week. And after about three weeks, everything felt better. I felt like I could think, I felt, I was feeling well on Lupron that my dream, I was being robbed of dreams, which is interesting. And I'll come back if you remind me if I don't. Um, uh, and I felt there's a certain thing, and we use that term in a fog, but I mean, I really felt that my cognitive processings were, processing was lost. And when I said my loss of dreams, I, I couldn't tell when I was trying to sleep whether I was just recount, remembering the day or just because I didn't, didn't rehashing it. But elaborate dreams of interesting and phantasmagorical nature just how we're, were gone on Lupron. When it went on estradiol, I seemed to be coming out of the fog I was feeling far more energetic. I was feeling far more clear headed. And I was being able to sort of dream the way I used to. And then I got a phone call from my oncologist. Uh, by the way, her name was Laurie, Laurie Wood. And she was so good. She actually ended up financially supporting my research early on, which, which is really astonishing to have your doctor support your research. But she's called me up in my office and said, Richard, do you know what your testosterone is right now? And I said, no, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure this experiment is failing because I feel better now than I ever did be, on the Lupron. She said, your testosterone is the lowest it's ever been. And that was a long, elaborate personal story, but that was truly, and I've written this up as an essay, a eureka, or eureka moment for me. Uh, because at that point, I, I, as I was a scientist before I was a prostate cancer patient, and I decided this was worth studying. And over the next year and a half, <clears throat> I got a graduate student, and we started uh, castrating male rats and giving them estrogen. Uh, and we showed that we could improve their sleep. We showed that we could reduce daytime fatigue. We showed that we could, uh, that they had better REM sleep when REM sleep is when we dream. Uh, so here they are androgen deprived, but high dose estrogen rats, uh, male rats. And we even showed, because we did experiments, my, my graduate student, is, this is Eric Wobolo, who's now on the faculty at Otago University in New Zealand. And uh, we even did some sexual encounter experiments, and the rats even had res residual um, sexual interests. Now, this did not elevate them to a, 
uh, testosterone level of libido, but it elevated them above the bottom of, of, uh, of castrated levels. So we've, and in fact, we actually published that, suggest, showing that rats estrogen could uh, uh, preserve some el some level of sexual interest in rats. And about a year, uh, a year later, the human data came out of Harvard showing that to be true. So that is um, the personal story. Now, more detail, because I noticed in the news that went out that said I was on the patch. So I've been essentially following the patch protocol. But in fact, that's the patch is a big study going on right now in the UK where they're putting patients on uh, drugs like the LHRH uh, uh, agonist, like Lupron, although they call it Lucrin there, um, uh, and Zolidex, uh, uh, versus using transdermal estradiol patches. So they call it the patch study, but it's transdermal estradiol. And after about two years, I found the patches discolored my skin a little bit. Uh, you had to figure out what was the right schedule for changing them. And I went over to using Estragel, a gel product. It's, I consider it far more convenient than the patches. Um, and as a, a couple of other parts of the story is when I moved to Vancouver 10 years ago, uh, I uh, had changed oncologist. My oncologist was interested in my situation. And he said, you know, you may be cured by now. And I said, I don't know, because I'd be just happy enough to stay on it. Uh, and he actually, and this is bad science, he convinced me to do an end of one experiment and go off of the estradiol. And I went off the estradiol and my PSA climbed within a matter of weeks. Uh, and it climbed over three other, two other readings, uh, and three uh, readings of rising PSA was all I needed to go back on the estradiol. And I've stayed on it ever since. Um, uh, other parts of it are that uh, you, there's a, a huge amount of debate about what are the downsides. And this is the important point. What are the pros and cons of going on the estradiol? So when people look at this, um, typically they look at, they, well, first of all, we don't want the cardiovascular risk that you see with DES. And that's been now published by the patch team. It doesn't appear to have the, the risk. Uh, the early patch guys like Paul Abel were right. If we don't take it orally, it can be safe. Secondly, does it provide the same protections that we're looking for from estrogen and testosterone? And that is, for instance, bone protection. So for instance, in us men, we have testosterone, maybe you all know this, at a certain level in our bodies, but we make it directly from our testosterone. So whenever a guy goes on a drug like Lupron or Zolodex or Eligard uh, or Formagon, they crash the testosterone, have no testosterone left over to make estrogen, and therefore, they get all the side effects of menopause, the hot flashes, the risk of osteoporosis, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, one is concerned about whether we'll be bone protective. And it appears that the uh, that uh, transdermal estradiol can be bone protective. So we don't have the risk of breaking, of falling down. And guys on ADT do fall down more, and they do get osteoporosis, and they do have a 15% increased risk of, of fractured bone. So osteoporosis by itself is not disabling. It's when you break down and fall down and break a bone, it's disabling. So those are the plus sides of the estradiol. I mean, many of them I've given. There's a couple of downsides. Um, and I'm, I don't know if I can bend the camera, but I have some breasts. Um, I will actually, I don't, I don't know if I can show you, I'm gonna understand well. But I mean, there's some breast tissue here. You would not know it unless I pointed it out. And I recognize that we discussed this side effect in the book. I mean, to some guys, that is intolerable. And I've had one patient over the years, and I've talked to hundreds of patients on ADT, who was going to go back to his doctor when he had read about the fact that he could develop breasts to some extent on some of these drugs, that that was unacceptable to him, and he would rather die than develop breasts. So that was one extreme. And the other patients, they don't care. And I recognize this is a personal view. I'm interested in, in why there's so much variation. I recognize that to some men it's intolerable. And one of my co-authors, who happens to be an ND and a prostate cancer patient, uh, was bothered by it enough uh, um, that he, who is on estradiol, by the way, uh, and he went for a mastectomy, which can be done. I mean, you can get a surgical mastectomy. Um, and that, by the way, I, mean, I, I am, I'm, a, I'm concerned about how men view it. I'm not uh, judging them. I'm not saying, God, you have to have a mastectomy. Are you, are, are, uh, uh, don't, uh, don't worry about it. I recognize that it's a, a very personal issue and men vary greatly on it. Uh, but at the same time, I, where I, when I talk about this in our ADT educational classes, which are free, uh, is I, I don't want somebody to say, I look terrible, I've gained weight on ADT, I've now got some breasts, I'm too embarrassed to go to the gym and then not exercise. 
So if it's, if it's a barrier to exercising, then that's a real downside to it. Um, uh, let's see, some other things to say. There are some neat pieces of research that haven't been done here that really need to be done. So for instance, we know that on ADT, uh, the hot flashes can cause the night sweats, which can disrupt, disrupt sleep very badly. So you can get fatigue. You get fa fatigue from ADT for primary, like the LHRH drugs, this can be pretty bad. Um, but it can be due in part to the, uh, some direct effect of the drugs. It can be due in part to disruption um, of sleep. Uh, it can be due to lack of exercise uh, and inadequate circulation. Uh, and we know that it even gets worse if you start to go on the uh, uh, enzalutamide, atotulamide, darolutamide drugs. The fatigue can be far worse. Um, so I found myself sleeping better. And if you're not, if you're sleeping better, you're going to be less in a fog less uh, cognitively impaired. So we know that the LHRH drugs, at least there's been so many studies, that, well, there's one or two exceptions, but the majority point to a risk, a risk, a small risk, but a real risk of cognitive impairment on the LHRH drugs. There's one study, and it's a weak study, it's a tiny study, suggesting that there isn't a level of cognitive impairment with estrogen, but that needs to be revisited when we have information on sleep patterns, because if there's not, if there's less cognitive impairment, is it simply due to the fact the guys are sleeping better? I don't know, it's unstudied. Um, but that's the sort of variables that we need to be looking at. Um, you know what, uh, I will stop there and ask uh, Len if he's willing to open the mics or tell me if there's any questions and we'll see where we go from there. And I can go back into monologues if, if that's appropriate uh, and answer whatever questions you guys might have. What do you got, anything Len? We, we do have questions. Um, Len, Len, can I just, uh, can I just welcome Dr. Mark Perlo as well, who um, is also going to join the organizers because Dr. Mark has some questions in there, but he has a lot of experience um, from his professional career working with estrogen and, and hormones. So we, we asked Mark if he, if he would participate too. So I just want to thank him for being on the call. I want to add, I want to add. I want to add one thing that Mark Perlo is an MD. Um, so I was introduced as doctor. I'm a PhD doctor, not an MD doctor. And everything I'm saying is academic and educational. I'm not offering any medical advice here or, or, uh, or anything that could be, which should be construed as that. I'm offering my scientific and perspective and my personal perspective. Okay, Len, what have I got? Mark, you do have some questions. Why don't you ask them directly of uh, Richard? Um, sure. Uh, let me go back to where I was. Um, I think I started with uh, there are agents that we use. A lot of times women can't tolerate estrogen. And we now have selective estrogen receptor modulators, which are like estrogen in that they cut down the hot flashes. They have some benefits uh, that estrogen has, but they block mm -hmm. other um, adverse effects. These are oral medicines, but I'm wondering if you've seen research on the use of uh, these estrogen-like synthetic compounds in dealing with prostate cancer. So we're, we're talking about, if I can name one drug, uh, tamoxifen. Uh, and there's a paper that I published about five years ago, a review article called Tamoxifen in Men, which uh, was attentive to the, exactly the points that Mark just raised. Uh, and asking where, where, where do we stand with, with tamoxifen? And in our review, I was actually surprised because uh, women typically, uh, a, a subset of, of breast cancer patients really hate the drug. Um, and where do we stand? Um, and uh, I actually could not find that in the, in the in male literature. Uh, they seem to be doing reasonably well. Uh, and however, there are the guys who are, who say, oh, if you're going to go on estrogen for all of its benefits, uh, you should take tamoxifen uh, to, to suppress the, uh, the risk of gynecomastia breast development. Um, now, this is not official, and I consider it completely off the record, but I've talked to Ruth Langley, who's the head of the clinical trials group at the UK, who runs the, the PATH study. And they have data they have not published. And she says, oh, yeah, we got to get around to publishing it. Because the question came up early on in the patch, would they let guys on tamoxifen or not? Uh, and that is, if they were taking estrogen and they were worried about it, could they take tamoxifen? So they had them in the study early on. 
and they have a, they have a sign of increased risk of osteoporosis in that population. So Mark, I'll ask you a question. Do the women who go into moxifen have an increased risk of uh, fracture and osteoporosis? I don't think they do. It's not an area that I've followed up. Um, our use as a reproductive endocrinologist is short term. I'm not familiar with using those drugs long term for um, uh, cancer protection, breast cancer management. We've used a lot of letrozole, and it's interesting that in um, by blocking the aromatase activity, uh, letrozole prevents the conversion of testosterone. And I've seen papers that suggest that if you're using letrozole uh, along with ADT, uh, you're going to lose some of the benefits and they're going to have worse uh, hot flashes. Their testosterone, re those on testosterone replacement are going to uh, maintain a testosterone level higher. Mm -hmm. um, okay. No. So, uh, first of all, Mark, did I answer your first question about the serum? Did I give you an yes. answer? Yes. Okay. So, moving on to the next one. I mean, that's what's also happened because of the history with diethylstobesterol. There is a subgroup of people who either hear this, and some of them are the physicians who just are not on top of the literature, some of them are the patients, that estradiol is terrible and bad, and we've got to stay away from it. Okay. But they're forgetting the fact that men normally produce estradiol, and it protects their bones. Okay, just as it protects the bones of women. And we produce it by uh, from, uh, so I mentioned earlier from testosterone, but it's actually the enzyme that, that Mark mentioned, aromatase. So breast cancer patients who've got to be off of estrogen go on the aromatase. And I actually, it's a personal story, my sister does have breast cancer. So I'm on estrogen and she's on an aromatase inhibitor. And we can compare notes. Um, so <laughs> you don't have the hot flashes. She you, does. You, <laughs> they have horrible hot flashes. Exactly. And I really hate those uh, yep. medications. Um, As do the guys who we put it on for um, improving sperm count because it yeah. drives things along. Now, yeah. if you're on estrogen, um, is it working solely by suppressing the release of LH and FSH for the brain? If that's what it's doing, um, I just finished a six-month course of abiraterone because the adrenal gland puts out um, a significant yeah. amount of, of androgen as well. So I'm wondering how this works and what about adrenal androgens? Uh, there is uh, no evidence that it will suppress, that estrogen would suppress testosterone to the abiraterone level. So I love this term, and I don't know whether, Mark, you come across it. But in the book, I use it It's because it is in the medical literature. Whereas the LHRH drugs, and I mean by that, both the agonist and antagonist, are considered androgen deprivation. Abiraterone is androgen annihilation uh, because, because it, uh, it wipes out even the adrenal. No, uh, th it works specifically through the, uh, through the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, uh, and they measure FS, and that is follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, uh, has been measured in studies on these patients on uh, on uh, high dose transdermal estradiol, and it is strictly working through that hypothalamic pituitary loop uh, uh, per se. Um, oh, uh, so I'm going to speak up and ask a question, and, and the question really is just an extension of what you just said. What happens when pa very many patients become refractory to a what you call ADT alone, and then they're put on the second generation, which you call androgen and annihilation agents? And the question then is, what's the role of estrogen under those clinical situations where they need to suppress estrogen production? in the tumor all right and then, so, and then richard let me ask let me ask the extension there which is really i think a, a question then can estrogen added to that i mean i didn't find any data and i've looked is there any data which says that adding estrogen in that situation when you're annihilating testosterone can okay. help with these other parameters yeah, the, the, there, uh, there's a lot there to unpack. And if I drift off too much, pull me back in here. 
Um, so the very, there, uh, there's a school which says estrogen is terrible, it causes blood clots. We, you stay away from any of it. Or to, wow, estrogen is perfect, it's wonderful, we've got to be taking it. And then the questions come up now, well, what about re uh, with all these issues about sequencing, or adding uh, enzalutamide plus abirin in this sequence, or, or cycling in the chemo agents, uh, is there a place for throwing in uh, estradiol? And just like we don't know whether really, but it's better now, we don't know, it's too early to know whether lutetium-177 is uh, going to be better if you take it before enzalutamide, and whether you would be better if you've been on enzalutamide to switch to darolutamide, and all of these other sequencing questions. The questions you're asking were, have, were never ans asked because <clears throat> uh, in the days of DES, we didn't know about the chemo agents that were effective. We didn't know about the antiandrogens that were second generation effective. We didn't have abirinor. And now no drug company, this is an important one, it's a political statement. No drug company can market uh, uh, estrogen for men. All right, you can say, wow, this is, everything I've said, this deserves some real clinical trials. And they're, and they're right. But because it's a natural hormone, no drug any company can get a, a proprietary uh, uh, um, access or uh, in control of estradiol. If one company sells it, another company can try to market it a little bit below and they realize there'll be a competitive market and nobody will make a lot of money. So those are really good questions. Is, it, is there a chance that this might be useful uh, put into the sequence with the second, third, fourth, you know, cycle of these drugs and we're finding that you know we're if you've done if you've done um uh docetaxel it can be useful to come back a second time with enzalutamide those type of questions raise the possibility that uh for a patient with really advanced disease who's been through three or four rounds of treatment that there may be a case for it i don't know and it hasn't been asked but the saddest part is it's unlikely to be asked because there's nobody doing the right clinical trials however it'll be asked but nobody will answer it yeah, that's right. Okay, but it does raise a whole other area, and that is what about using estradiol while you're on standard ADT to manage the ADT side effects? So that's a whole second issue. I've talked only so far about high-dose estradiol right. as an ADT agent. But what if you'd use a low-dose estradiol to suppress the, the, symptom. um, the symptoms, the side effects of the standard ADT agents? And there is finally a clinical trial underway. It's out of Melbourne, Australia. Um, uh, uh, Russell is his last name, who's, who's running the trial. It's Grossman and Russell. You can pull it up if you look them up. They're endocrinologists uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, if you send me the, if you can't find the paper, I can pull it up for you. Just look up uh, transdermal estradiol, ADT, uh, and you'll, you'll pull up the paper. It, it, my personal and sad part is I helped when I, I moved to Vancouver 10 years ago, I started the uh, Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program uh, here at the Vancouver General Hospital, which has now become a provincial-wide program. And we actually got a grant from Prostate Cancer Canada to do an ad back estradiol study. And then I retired. It was, well, it was, I was you know, in my 70s. It was time, you know, I could retire. I left with my clinical colleagues and they are high rollers. They're expecting drug companies to back research. Uh, re research with patients is, uh, is expensive, and um, it turns out they never accrued. They never put the effort in, and they ended up giving the money back to my astonishment and embarrassment and shame. Uh, however, uh, 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 the, uh, Russell and Grossman in Melbourne about two years ago started the study, and they already have data on osteoporosis to show that it is protective. Uh, I don't know if that's already been published or not. Uh, so yeah, certainly, I just, I just found the paper. What? You just found it? Okay. Yes. So, uh, all right. So they're so they're they're a good group, and I visited them a year ago, just before lockdown, a year and two months ago in Melbourne. Um, uh, so I'm very pleased to see that somebody's doing some real clinical work on that back estradiol. And now it is not a blinded study at this stage. But so many people, doctors are now accepting using a little bit of estradiol as had back. Um, that nobody has asked me yet, but what about the dangers? Aren't there any real dangers other than gynecomastia? And I would be remiss if I didn't mention some really serious stuff. And Mark can comment on this. Um, uh, if I do talk to someone, they call me up and this happens. 
uh, and say, I'm, I really, I've heard, read about it. I've seen chat list about it. I want to go on estradiol, but I can't convince my doctor. The first thing I want to know is, do you have breast cancer in your family? Do you have BRCA1-2? Do you have ATM um, mutations? <clears throat> because if you are at high risk of some of these uh, breast cancer, uh, estrogen uh, sensitive uh, 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 gene, gene line situations, you are at high risk of estrogen sensitive prostate cancer as well. And going on estrogen would be a bad idea. And actually, this is funny. I will admit with the, how many people we have here on here, 40 of you guys, if you don't tell this story to anybody else, I'll admit, tell an embarrassing story myself, on myself. And that is when I got to my new oncologist here uh, and moved out from Vancouver, to, from Halifax to Vancouver. And this guy's name is by Kim Cheese, his name. He's a, he is now the head of the BC Cancer Agency. And he's brilliant and, and brilliant scientist. I said, you know, I'm really, I'm starting to think about it. Maybe I should have some genetic, um, the testing to see whether I'm estrogen sensitive. His answer was, don't bother. If you were estrogen sensitive, you'd be dead by now. Um, so so I, I think uh, I don't, I'm not promoting this. And I think that if someone thinks I want to go in high dose estradiol for ADT, uh, they really should make sure that they're not at risk of an estrogen sensitive variant of prostate cancer. I was going to, uh, to note that the amount that you would use to suppress gonadotrophins is dramatically greater than the amount we would use five to 10 times at least greater yeah. than what we might use to alleviate uh, the symptoms. Um, um, two other questions though. Sure, um, go ahead. One is castrate resistance then. Does it have any role in the castrate resistant patient? Um, and castrate resistance, I think is a misnomer because we still use uh, the second line receptor blockers, which imply that uh, testosterone is still doing something. And then the other, is there any benefit in terms of erectile dysfunction uh, being corrected with estrogen? Okay. Um, uh, there is no direct physiological benefit that we know of for the erectile dysfunction. However, uh, there is the indirect psychosexual, psychosocial side of it. So uh, a, um, a part of erection is erotic uh, association. Uh, and a lot of my research is more in sexuality than, than in uh, endocrinology. Um, and uh, what is a tragedy associated with ADT uh, is that we guys, we go on the standard uh, uh, LHRH drugs or abiraterone along with them, we lose our libido. If we have partners, and I'll speak only to female partners because there's no work research done on male partners, although I published uh, one paper on, on gay prostate cancer patients. Uh, actually, I won two papers on that. Um, the, uh, what happens is our partners typically, are, so I'm going to give the heterosexual context. We guys, if we have a partner, female partner, we get we have ways of signaling interest. Uh, and I'm not talking about uh, you know grabbing them inappropriately or you know, whatever in the in the cross. I'm talking about a, a kiss on the neck, a hug when we come in the door. We have ways of showing them that we know they're there. We lose our libido and we may forget to to make the contact. And this is where the ADT becomes a double tragedy. And this is not new with me. This has been the literature for 25 years. The psychological barriers of ADT are, uh, a psychological uh, challenges of ADT are actually greater on the partners of men than, uh, uh, than on the men themselves. And there's studies going back, out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, published in the journal of Cancer, showing that to be true. The paper was published about 25 years ago. Now. If it turns out that estrogen can help preserve a, some of the libido, then it, and, and we think, oh, hey, I, I got to show my wife that even though I have no erections more and I can't, we can't have like, penile vaginal sex like we used to, that I still appreciate her. She may turn back uh, and come back by showing how much she appreciates us. And that can be erotic. So I can't, that I would, I would hardly say that that is a cure for erectile dysfunction, for severe erectile dysfunction. However, uh, it can maintain a, a, a co-supportive household, which I think is a, incredibly important. Uh, so that's a, a bit of a psychosexual, psychosocial aside. 
What was the other question? You asked me another one? Oh, yes. Let's go ahead, Mark. S trade resistance. So this is, again, where we don't know. Um, we have no real data. But again, uh, if what I, what, what I can say is that considering that the primary way that the estrogen is working is through the standard overdrive to the gonadal hypothalamic, hypothalamic pituitary loop. If we're going to put that in overdrive and we're doing that in overdrive, I do not see it being any, admit, any better or worse with no evidence to go on than the than Lupron. Uh, and I would not say if someone says I'm getting castor resistance, I want to go on Lupron. I want, will estrogen help? I don't imagine that it will, but I don't know. There's been no work on it. Is that a fair answer, Mark? Yes, I think that addresses it. Uh, there's so much that we don't understand about the conversion from hormone sensitive to uh, castrate resistance. And a lot of stuff is coming out now without uh, clear data um, in clinical trials to uh, support those suppositions. I have a question I'd like to ask. I mean, Mark and I could go at this for a while because he's really asking the right questions. But I, don't, I want to make sure we're not losing people. And if I've used any technical terms or language where, where you're not sure what I said, I'm happy to repeat it, happy to try to reword it to make sure that, it, that nobody's been the lost in the crowd. Uh, are, 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 are there any other questions? Yes. We yes. Just, yes. Uh, we do have others. Let, let me ask one from John Ivory, which is, can you talk a little more about the mechanics of wearing the patches? Is it like sure. a Band-Aid? When do you change them? <clears throat> Does it come off in the shower? Yeah, all right. So the patches are made for, no, these are the same patches used for women who are trying to deal with hot flashes and the menopausal symptoms themselves. And they come in a different, they're just, they're like a Band-Aid, they're a little patch with a little bit of, you know, the Band-Aid edge around the side. And if the patch is supposed to be a large volume, it's this, if it has to have a little bit less estrogen, it's smaller. And it's just, the dose is simply dependent on the surface area. And you can put them on your abdomen. Um, it's better, it may be seem less perhaps invasive on the buttocks, but you might rub them off with your pants by sitting in chairs and so forth. The, um, there's pros and cons to the patches over the gel, and I'll go off on a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, typically, because of the adhesive used on the patches, some of the cl closed dye can come off. And so I would see after wearing one of these patches for five or six days, I might get, if I was wearing a black t-shirt, um, I might get a, uh, a little bit of color on my skin around the patch. The other part about the patch that, and this is going to get, I mean, interesting, would, this is worth probably a long call with Mark. The, the patches are designed to be quantized, to provide a stable dose of, of estrogen through the week. To, to achieve high dose estradiol, um, you, need to, you need to put on a lot of patches. Early on, they started them at one dose in the UK, and then they realized when they looked at the blood test results, these guys were not getting full testosterone suppression at the level they expected. So they had to rejig the whole thing. And what they ended up with is schedules. Uh, I'll put on four patches this day, and every third day I'll change two patches, and then every fourth day I'll change another. And they came up with all sorts of schedules. Furthermore, um, what was happening, and I saw this going back 15 years ago, the guys who were uh, uh, trying the patches who weren't in the study in the United States, for instance, um, are, are interested in this and independently following the literature like I was, were agonizing because they were trying to reach a stable a serum estrogen concentration. And they would put on, and they would uh, this uh, rejig re re their schedule. So I'm going to change two patches every five days or you know, whatever. They'd come up with incredible schedules trying to get a stable dose. And frankly, with an endocrinologist on, on, in the conversation, it ain't going to work. And it won't work because it's caught you. Yeah, thank you for shaking your head in agreement. It's not going to work because estrogens, in fact, the gonadal hormones, and this is a, a fascinating complexity that it's hard to explain the biology to, but the estrogens regulate their own receptor density. Okay, we know this from women, and that is that if they have enough estrogen, uh, they will uh, go through menstrual cycles, which will give them a cyclic dose of estrogen in their a cyclic concentration of estrogen in their in their serum in their blood, and that it, uh, that produces a, a metastable situation. It's cyclic, all right. But 
but that cyclic feedback with up and down helps to keep the concentration of the uh, receptors high. Uh, and if you try to go for a stable, stable dose, okay, you're not going to get a stable receptor level. And if you don't have a stable receptor level, then it's going to drift. And I had 50 measures over the first 10 years of blood uh, concentrations where I plotted them out and there was no good correlation between my estradiol level and my uh, number of amount of gels uh, or my T levels. They were all over the place. And I simply, re if you're gonna go for high dose estradiol, the reason that I have, and I, Mark, please tell me if this sounds right, is I definitely did not want my serum testosterone levels to get above the normal range for women before menopause. I didn't wanna to get to a range where they might get into blood clots, right? I didn't wanna get above that. But if my testosterone got high, I'd just uh, add some more uh, uh, of the patches or add more gel. Now, what I really think would be the really neat experiment, but no drug company is going to do it, is that probably the best way to get the most estradiol control of your testosterone is probably a cyclic dose that matches the female menstrual cycle. But I can't prove it. I would, I, but it, what I do for myself is I every time I get a PSA, I get my testosterone measured, my estradiol measured. Okay, and if my testosterone is a little bit higher, I'll add a little estrogen. If my estrogen is too high, uh, I'll bring it back down. And, and, I, and by using the gel, I can't quantify it as nearly as well. So I, um, in the morning, uh, after shower, I'll spray it on my skin. I, I rub it in; it dries completely. That doesn't get greasy or anything like that. And I put it on. I put three squirts on an average. But if it looks like I'm a little low, I'll put on four squirts. If I'm a little high, I'll put on, uh, uh, I'll cut back to three squirts. And I don't worry about how many patches. I don't change them. And I personally, I, in fact, I was, I'm a co-author with the patch study in Europe um, with cousin of Paul Abel and Ruth Langley on one about the quality of life. And I insisted, you got to stop calling it the patch. You're talking about transdermal estradiol. And that's the one paper where they, but the study was called the patch study. So everybody thinks it's a patch. And then they try, they can't get the right dose in their blood that they think they should have. And they get nuts by trying to quantify it. But um, I think I just try to stay in, in ranges where I'm getting adequate testosterone suppression without going too high into blood clot range. And that's where I, that's where I aim for, informally. Mark, so, um, can I, can I yeah. just remind everybody, uh, if you have a question, please put it in the chat window. Um, we're not we're not going to take verbal questions. Um, it's just too complicated. Too many people on the call. So uh, Ron, Ron Goldberg, if you have a question, open the chat window. It's the little bubble at the top, and please type your question into that, and then it'll come back through Len or Mark or or, or her. Uh, I guess given you, what you just said, I'm going to repeat one of Ron Goldberg's questions, which is. You know, what do you use as a serum estradiol test? And how often do you do it? Uh, I do it whenever I... Whenever. Okay, I, I, I get my uh, serum estradiol every time I get a, and my testosterone and my PSA. And I, I, at this point, I'm doing it every four months. Um, uh, so approximately every four months. Um, as, a, as an aside about that, I have good PSA control. And after 20 years of this, I still can't get over blood test anxiety, and it pisses me off. As a scientist, I think I should be able to get past it, but I can't. But, um, uh, uh, maybe Mark can give you the numbers here, but I, I, I don't have them right in front of me, but it depends on what unit you're using. But I try not to get above what is listed in literature as uh, the top level for normal for females. That's it. That's all I worry about. I don't want to be below that level, but have testosterone control. And over the years, it's turned out to be three to four squirts of the gel, and that's fine. I think the uh, the main thing you're trying to do is reduce gonadotropins. Yep. So, uh, and and LH is all over the place. It's easily suppressed. Mm -hmm. um, when we're using low dose therapy in menopause, we find that uh, suppressing FSH uh, because it's a little bit more of a stable hormone. Um, <clears throat> provides the same kind of benefit. So I would judge the effectiveness of estrogen by where your FSH and your testosterone level were more so than looking at estrogen because they can be all over the map. The coefficient of variation 
from day to day and from uh, running the same sample repeatedly is fairly significant. And just the way we stress over um, PSA levels, I'm not sure that uh, adding in estrogen testing is going to be as important. You really want to know, is the estrogen going to shut things off? Okay. I wanted to reiterate what you said about the patches. We use patches to um, get the uterine lining ready for embryo transfers. And we'll have people put four patches on. And then every two days, some one day will be a change on the right side. One will be change on the left, change on the, the thigh and this thigh. And I know uh, the testosterone for me worked much better as a gel and in getting the levels up previously uh, when I was doing that. And I would assume that that would be a better way to get estrogen. Any uh, role for progesterone in this? Because progesterone is a somewhat more potent suppressor of, of the uh, gonadotropins, but doesn't affect or improve quality of life okay a lot a lot of stuff there thanks um uh now i don't know if you guys picked up on this if you're not a, a, uh it's endocrinology uh, uh mark used a, a new agent that i hadn't mentioned gonadotropin but it turns out when you're talking about lhrh or gonadotropin you're talking about the same thing they come two from dames it took me a year or two and i got just to try to figure out what that was going on and if you work with the women reproductive because of the ways these drugs were discovered these hormones were discovered uh, they have the same hormone has two different names from the male literature and the female literature. And, and, and her, uh, Mark comes from the female literature side. And Mark, you know, another point on that, on the gonadotropin LH issue, is you're absolutely right. It would be much better if I were much more precise if I were measuring the LH. There's these two hormones that come down from the pituitary, LH and follicle-stimulating hormone, or gonadotropin and follicle-stimulating hormone. Uh, that's not going to be paid for for free. I'm up in Canada. All this is free, all right? But, but uh, to get the doctor to prescribe it, because it's free, uh, they'd, I'd have to have a really good reason. Uh, and um, I don't. Uh, and I could argue with him, I suppose, or I could pay for it myself. Um, but uh, I have not run into problems for 20 years, so I haven't bothered. But, but if, we'd really, if I were doing, this, doing it scientifically, that's the way to do it. And the people who are running the patch study do measure it for the patients in that large study. And some of you may have heard about what's called the Stampede Study. In, uh, it's a huge study, brilliantly designed, because it's a rolling study that she's, just keeps on adding arms in the UK for prostate cancer, and, and now patches part of Stampede, uh, that big study. There was something else at the end of your comment, Mark, that now has left my mind. What was the other thing you said? There? Oh, yeah, the progesterones. Ah. Huh. Oh, okay. So there's a drug called Androcure, which is a, a synthetic progesterone. Which we do not use in North America. Here we onto something where Canada and the United States are in the same ra same range. In the book, uh, when I was going through uh, various drugs that can be used to shut down the system, uh, I got uh, some of the urologists in Europe reminding me there are still places where they use Androcure, a wonderful name for a drug. All right, so you could do the whole thing with a progesterone. So women women have two sets of gonadal hormones. They produce estrogen and progesterone. And e either one of those can also shut the sloop down. And so it gets really complicated in women because you got to get these the estrogen and the progesterone going up and down to regulate normal menstruation. Uh, but you can actually use a synthetic progesterone. Women don't particularly like life when they're high on progesterone. Guys particularly don't like it. The drugs are still around because there is one group of, of uh, people who really want to get their testosterone down and really want it to be cheap. And they're not going to be able to get this expensive drugs like Lupron easily. Okay, so, and these are the transsexuals. Um, so the, the, their culture uh, has a, a, a fighting for uh, Cipertrone, which is the other name for Androcure. Uh, and I've, I've heard discussions about, I can't get it in the United States. I have to get it from, from Thailand or whatever. But it's not a great drug. And I, I mean, it's super cheap. Uh, but we do not use it uh, for for prostate cancer in North America, because it's, it's just the side effects, it's just not good. Um, that's awfully simple. But, but again, Mark, do you want to add to that? Um, again, I was wondering more about combining it, um, because ah. when we're doing menopausal therapy, uh, 
the, the, the present thinking is that the menopause hot flash is due to increasing gonadotropins, and you can suppress that uh, with a combination of estrogen and progesterone. Wondering if your progesterone suppresses uh, hormones and then your estrogen makes people feel better. So this again, and I hope, I don't know if we're losing all these people or whatever, but I hope we're not, but this is fascinating because as I said, the female system is far more complicated. And I've suggested as a fly, a flying idea out of the blue, that maybe we should be trying to uh, put estrogen into its natural cycle for women, having no other model to do it. And now what we've added in is the other, other major hormones, the progesterone. And, and Mark, you are five to 10 years ahead of wherever we are until some brilliant million billionaire comes forward and starts to do the right studies and says, I'm going to back research on estrogen, even if I don't have a drug company to make money off of it. But these are, that's a lovely question. And uh, I'm, I'm not ready to try it myself. Uh, are you? Are you willing to try it? Estrogen plus progesterone? Well, I graduated from ADT, so at least for now, I'm an no. <laughs> um, observer. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but you can see, I think this is a good, for the rest of you, I think it's a good discussion to realize how much we don't know and why this stuff is off-label, and it has to be uh, seen as off-label at this point. I guess, uh, uh, Len, are there more questions? I do have need? one I'd like to get in, Richard, if, if you have the time. Sure. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, Rich, uh, Peter Kafka uh, has been on intermittent ADT for seven years or so, and uh, he has uh, lower uh, levels of hemoglobin and hematocrit than most guys on ADT. He's down around the nine level, I believe, hemoglobin. So he's he his question is uh, he's seen references to using estradiol in combination with this new. Uh, uh, ADT antagonist, Relagolix or Relagulix or Orgovix, whatever, you, however you want to pronounce it, uh, in uterine conditions to boost hemoglobin in women. So uh, he's saying for men like himself, might estrogen with Orgovix instead of Lupron uh, mitigate his anemia? Okay, so for everyone else, uh, Relagolix is a new oral uh, LHRH antagonist. So instead of Firmagon, which is a once a month injection and often has inflammation at the injection site, that you can go over this oral drug. It, it correctly, it was, it is correct. It was produced in, it was produced for women to deal with fibroids and that type of stuff issue out of Japan. And there's a push now, well, it's now available. And I don't know what it's costing in the United States. It's not even here. Uh, it's not here in Canada and I'm not even sure we'll be able to afford it. Um, I had not heard, and again, Mark might have something to say, I've not heard that it raises hemoglobin because LA depression of, of the testosterone will lower your hemoglobin in and of itself. So part of the fatigue that comes with androgen deprivation therapy uh, comes from uh, the suppression of testosterone, and I found less fatigue. There's no, no good data that I know of on, on, um, uh, on fatigue measured rigorously. Uh, or, but I know they're collecting anemia data um, for estrogen. But as for Firmagon and, and uh, uh, the oral uh, LA, oral LHR antagonist that's now out, Regulalix, um, I don't know anything about it, and I can't. I haven't even given a thought to what I would like to use it with with uh, transdermal estradiol. But it would make sense if you're having hot flashes um, that if you could be using it uh, low dose patch or gel to manage hot flashes and other menopausal symptoms, that you could do that with uh, Regulalix as well. Um, I yes. think the, Richard, can I follow up that, that absolute. comment of yours, which is uh, following Peter's question, never mind the, the, the antagonist, what will, do you, is, could you repeat the data or tell us what you know about the the effects of estrogen on uh, hemoglobin and hematopoiesis in the sure. in the context sure. of ADT. Sure, absolutely. Um, women typically run with a slightly lower hematocrit than men, uh, um, and that is natural. And you can go on androgen deprivation therapy, Sinsolato, broadly speaking, 
If you go on androgen deprivation, your, your, your uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit will drift down into the male range. Uh, that will not put you outside of the normal range for men, uh, but it is lower, and that can add to be part of the fatigue. However, um, it's, it's typically, not always, typically enough that the men can overcome it with exercise, uh, can stay, you know, can overcome the fatigue from it. Where I talk about this, because I, I, I measure my hematocrit every time I get a blood, blood test, and yes, it is low, and yes, I'm borderline anemic, uh, uh, but, I was, but that's where I stand. Uh, however, what I try to say to patients, if you are really fatigued on ADT, and I don't care what the agent is, you, you ought to get back to your physician because uh, you could also have uh, anemia from other causes. And at the same time, I also point out that if you think you're fatigued from, uh, uh, and you have from anemia, uh, the old ads when I was a kid were for Geritol, an iron supplement. Uh, and uh, uh, there is one paper that's been published in the last year suggesting that part of the uh, anemia, uh, drift towards anemia for men on ADT may be iron deficiency. Uh, but typically, the older studies suggest that it isn't necessary. But so if someone's really fatigued, I, I encourage them on ADT to get back to the doctor because they could also have uh, the, uh, anemia from any other causes, uh, and that needs to be investigated. Was that enough of an answer? I don't know. I'm looking to where you're sitting on my screen here. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Your question, you? Herb? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Of course. Other, I mean, well, I mean, I think the answer is we have no data. <laughs> or, or the answer is that, that you're, you're on high-dose estrogen and it's, your hematocrit is still low. Yeah, but not, not seriously low. It's borderline. Right on, typically, it's on the line. One month, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm marked off as a, on the blood test results as anemic. And then you look at the numbers and I'm just on the other side of the line. Sometimes I'm not. It, 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 it almost depends on how much exercise I've got. Um, I would be a concern if someone were a, um, a vegan uh, and they thought that was the right thing to do and they were tired and fatigued on ADT, I would be, and then they drifted to hemo, into a, uh, a, a real anemia, then they've got a problem uh, that needs to be investigated and, and diet maybe not in, working in their favor. Okay, Len, well, I'm happy to stay on the line as long as anybody wants to. I think this is, I hope I'm being helpful. Very right. helpful. Yes, thank you so much, Richard. Um, I have a, a quick question of my own. Uh, I believe I recall reading that uh, bicalutamide has, when used as monotherapy, has a higher incidence of gynecomastia than do the more recent uh, androgen receptor blockers. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not seeing that it has more or less risk than the higher uh, doses, because in fact, the higher the, do, the, the second generation anti androgens are now all being used in a secondary situation. Nobody's using them alone as a primary treatment. Whereas in Europe, a biclutamide, that's a, um, a degarelix, is used is still used, particularly in the Scandinavian and northern areas, as monotherapy. So you can use uh, 100, 150 milligram daily um, biclutamide uh, to suppress testosterone. But what happens then, okay, is you is a, uh, the extra you're not excuse me not suppressing testosterone. It's an androgen receptor. You're blocking the receptors, but you're still producing testosterone. So the high testosterone then converts to estradiol. If you're on high dose biclutamide, you're going to get more estradiol, so you're going to get gynecomastia. But I've not seen a proper comparison head to head for gynecomastia. It may be in the literature, but I just don't know of gynecomastia risk uh, for, uh, for, say, um, uh, enzalutamide versus bicalutamide. Uh, it, it's interesting. We see a, a condition in reproductive endocrine where we have men who are born with defective androgen receptors. Mm -hmm. And these guys have uh, very, very high levels of testosterone. They have very little body hair and large breasts um, as a result of uh, not, not acting on the testosterone receptor. So I imagine that uh, taking a receptor blocker would do the same thing here, as you said, raise the testosterone level, which then gets converted by these aromatase enzymes 
and uh, act in the same way as taking estrogen. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure that the combination might be any better than one or the other alone. So Richard, th th this is Rick. I just want to say a couple of things. One is that um, we are seeing um, more and more use of monotherapy second line antiandrogens. Mm -hmm. um, and Len is, is one of those people. Len's been on um, monotherapy darolutamide now for 18 months, Len, is that, is that right? Uh, no, not monotherapy. Monotherapy, I've only been on it for uh, about 10 months. 10 months, okay. Um, and we're seeing it also with abiraterone, um, and there have been studies published with abiraterone. So whilst the, the GU medical oncologists are not taking it up that quickly, there's some evidence that, um, that it may be an alternative. Okay, so um, Len, and, well, oh, sorry. I was Len, just going to say, and I have one question that I want to ask you that maybe you can come to after you respond to that, which is, if you were using um, estradiol pat or using estrogen to suppress your testosterone, what um, is considered to be a castrate level that you can achieve uh, uh, of testosterone? What do you what do you consider okay. to be the castrate level? Yeah, the same, same level, depending on what unit you're in. F Fifty or below is the standard, uh, and that's what I'm looking for. Uh, and I want to be, and I know I can get down to, I can get down with a high dose estradiol, and they know that it's already been published from the patch study. You get the same level of testosterone suppression. I mean, if you're not, you're not taking enough estrogen. I mean, that's why I mentioned early on in the past study, they had to change the number of patches because they weren't getting enough. But I want to go back because you asked I, something. So, so Len, you asked an interesting question. So do you have any, if you don't mind my asking, any gynecomastia from monotherapy darolutamide? No, none whatsoever. And I, before I went on the monotherapy, I asked Dr. O at Mount Sinai, you know, what are the chances that that might happen? And he said, in your case, very low chance because I've never been more than 170 pounds or so, you know, I'm six foot tall. So he said, you don't have any fat in your uh, breast. So there's nothing there to, to develop. I, I mean, I do about 20 push-ups every day at least. So, you know, so far, no sign whatsoever. It can happen in the liver, uh, aromatase enzyme. I'm wondering if you have checked estradiol to look at it, it would be interesting to see if there is a rise in, uh, it would pro predominantly be estrone, but you might see the estradiol as well. Yep, that's fascinating. Hello, Richard. I'd like to ask a question. My name is sure. Ron. Um, yes, I'm uh, just about to go on a, a, a patch, estradiol patch, and uh, I've, I've also just started a Lupron, and I want to monitor my serum uh, estradiol, and at LabCorp in the United States, they have an estradiol test, but they also have estradiol sensitive, and the sensitive test is uh, more accurate at lower levels of estradiol, which if I'm on a low dose uh, patch to mitigate the side effects from a uh, Lupron, I would be in that category, you know. Um, do, you, do you make a distinction of which estradiol, serum estradiol test to, um, to get? No, I, 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 that, as I said, I've had, uh... It's probably now been 100 blood tests over the last 20 years, uh, or well, not maybe 80, uh, and it, it fluctuates all over the place. All right, just as long as if you take if you're using it and you're still having hot flashes, then and, and it looks then you get a blood test and it looks low, you use a little, you add some more. And if you're starting to and if it gets very high, um, but um, that is on your blood test, you, you bring it down. But there's no case for doing a set high sensitivity test that I can think of, but I'm gonna turn this question over to, on the other side of my screen, a real, I, a real endocrinologist. Yeah, I agree entirely. Uh, that's used uh, uh, to figure out if the ovaries are still functioning, um, looking at menopause. Uh, it just, you don't need to go with the extra complicated test. Again, uh, I would use a regular estradiol 
test, but I might also look at where's the FSH, because if your FSH is still up, you're just not, I mean, you may feel good. And I think that's the thing that you brought up earlier is we're really looking at two things. Uh, we're looking at what is the estradiol level that you would need to feel good and 20 to 30 will probably get uh, 20 to 30 picogram per ml will probably get you to feel good but you may need a much higher blood level to suppress gonadotropins fully and lower testosterone so i think you have to decide what are you looking for what's your goal I'm looking for the low level. I'm not ready to do the high level yet. So I'm on Lupron and I do have very onerous uh, uh, side effects, especially hot flashes. So I, I want to go on probably a 0 0.025, you know, start off with a low level patch and see if I can mitigate the um, those side effects. But the other big thing I'm concerned about is uh, bone loss. I'm already osteoporotic. And I'm wondering um, if there is a, um, oh gosh, I just lost my, uh, oh yes. If monitoring uh, bone markers, bone turnover markers is useful when on ADT, and I will be on the low dose estradiol for keeping some sense of what's going on uh, with my bone health, I don't want to just rely on a DEXA scan once a year. It might be kind of late, you know, to go by a whole year and not get any feedback about my bone health. So I want to okay. yeah. it with uh, serum. Okay, uh, again, a couple, a couple of things. Uh, to here in Vancouver, uh, the standard protocol. Again, again we have uh, socialized medicine, uh, which means that uh, we we can't get everything, but we get it free. <laughs> what we get. Uh, and uh, the general policy is if you're going to be going on uh, at ADT uh, for more than six months, uh, you should probably get a, a DEXA scan. Now, it takes about six months uh, of time to get a, a, this, a, a reasonably good measure under normal circumstances of any change. So when you're getting a DEXA scan once a year, that's pretty good. Uh, but you're already osteoporotic. So presumably somebody's managing your osteoporosis. And you may be a uh, kid candidate based on even your baseline to be on some bone protective agency. Uh, um, and there are several out there. Yeah, so I, I, want to, I want to jump in here. Um, and, you know, if you are, first of all, I'd encourage you Ron to attend our group. I don't think you do. Um, but if you are osteoporotic and you're on long-term LHRH, long-term meaning nine months or more your um your doctor whoever is supervising your care should have you on some sort of a bone strengthener i um, mean i was in that situation when i was diagnosed i was marginally osteoporotic minus 2.4 in the spine and i got over three years over two over two years three infusions of zometa and it helped <clears throat> And so what I would encourage you to do um, is to talk to your doctor about some type of bone strengthening agent um, to, um, to prescribe some type of bone strengthening agent. But again, we really don't want to get into sort of a support situation right. in this call today. Um, I want to come back to, to, to Richard um, because you mentioned that you can get down below 50 as castrate level but what we see more and more in terms of controlling testosterone is that most gu medonks in the us today are looking to get men under 30 um, and if not even lower um, and i'm wondering um is the level of estrogen that we needed uh for um Mark, uh, wait, wait yourself. Sorry, there we go. Thanks. The, the level of estrogen that's needed to get you below thirty is that is, would that be a dangerous level of es estrogen? Uh, no. no, I mean, and I, I, I just, I'm, ha I'm, I, I'm old. It's not that I'm old school necessarily, and I do know, particularly for uh, 
uh, the literature. I, in fact, it's uh, um, uh, it's, it's not, not too much of it comes out of Canada suggesting we've got to make sure that we're really suppressing it. And that 50 numbers has dropped down to about 30. Uh, but back when I was collecting the data and watching it, uh, 50 was a standard. And that was like over 10 years. I actually, um, I know that I can get down below 50. That doesn't mean it wasn't getting below 30. It just meant okay. when I was watching it, uh, it, I knew I was getting into castrate range and I'm doing as well as I was on LHRH drugs. As I said, the very first time I got a measure, uh, my oncologist pointed out that it was lower on the estrogen than it was on um, Lupron. And that was great. That was a, that was a, a turning point in my life um, as a scientist here. Uh, there's another part, there's another thing I want to say about this in terms of of uh, this sort of issue around around uh, uh, sequencing. Uh, you mentioned, for instance, uh, Abby Radaron, uh, the uh, anti-androgens will raise the estrogen because you have the testosterone that's not being bound up to the androgen receptors. Abby Radaron does, is the another class, as you know, Rick. I mean, it's not, so it doesn't sort of fit that model. Um, uh, you're going to be, if you're on an anti-androgen monotherapy, uh, you're going to expect to have elevated estrogen. You're on an anti-androgen. Uh, if you go, you're on an androgen suppression or annihilation. You're going to expect the testosterone to be also annihilated. Um, yeah, Richard, that's Ken Anderson, and you're absolutely right. I've been listening, and I can tell you, most guys on here are pretty well informed in regards to these therapies. So yeah. your communication is probably spot on with most people. Good. Uh, okay. I'm good. The guys that is doing monotherapy on Abby. Yeah. And, uh, have seen in the last six, eight months, my breasts are growing like crazy. Mm. On monotherapy with Abby, you're getting with breast Abby, growth. you shouldn't, Ken, that's un, it's unusual because you're really not making oh. any hormones. Well, they're growing. Okay. I have no testosterone, but I was taking tamoxifen for three and a half years. So, and the Anderson standard for gynecomastic mm. They, they prescribe tamoxifen. So, out of my, you're above my head. We, now oh. end, we call upon our endocrinologist. <laughs> I do. Before so. we do that. I can't, I can't add to that. I would have thought the same thing, that uh, it would not be seen with abiraterone. Um I mean, it, it uh, would seem to be definitely when you're using the uh, receptor blockers, you're going to see the elevation. Um, I'm just not sure, and I didn't look at that in my uh, experience in abiraterone. Okay, uh, okay. So I, I can't. I'll, ask, I'll ask Paul, and I'll just see what his comments oh, are. I don't so, know why. Uh, so, uh, I've one, we do have, we're running out of time, but I do want to catch one last question that Alfred asked, and he, he especially would like you to repeat the discussion of not using uh, estrogen if you have a BRCA mutation. Wow. Uh, um, all right. So uh, there's a wonderful paper by Gail Rusbridger, who's uh, in uh, Melbourne, Australia again. Uh, she's an, a molecular biologist. And it was titled uh, "Prostate Can something like prostate cancer and breast cancer more similar than, than different. Uh, and it's a lovely paper from about 10 years ago. We looked at the pathways and so forth. Uh, and this, I didn't get it. This gets really complicated. Um, uh, uh, but uh, estrogen, when it's high, as I said, estrogen re regulates its own receptor density. And the receptor that helps to control prostate cancer, that's a very general way of speaking, is the beta receptor. But if you start to lose the beta receptor, then the alpha receptor got, uh, becomes dominant. And uh, uh, to, uh, the gonadal hormones can bind to the the estrogen alpha receptor and promote prostate cancer growth. It's, it's that bizarre and that complicated. All right, so uh, what you end up with is a situation where um, estrogen can turn bad when it was good. And, and what happens is these particular mutations uh, like the BRCA, the BRCA genes are controlling the ability to correct for things that are wrong. That's my effort to try to make it really simple. But they're corrective for, for you know, all the time you're, you're getting mutations, to, you're getting breaks, you're getting changes to your chromosomes, and they repair themselves. 
but the repair mechanisms themselves can get screwed up. And some of these genes, a lot of these genes, if you hear about immunotherapies and so forth, are actually looking at um, genes that affect the repair mechanism. And the BRCA genes are in that realm. I'm going to count for someone to jump in here um, and, and, and help me out because I'm trying to keep the wording general. Uh, so what can happen then is when these little breaks in the chromosomes occur that don't get repaired in time, uh, the BRCA mutations mean that your repair mechanism of the break is, confu- is, is, is corrupted, and then the cancer can run wild. What? So, so this happened. I mean, uh, in fact, I had a fun article I wrote on male breast cancer, uh, a little essay about a, year, uh, uh, about a year ago I published, uh, looking at this because um, a ba- 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 Bayonne, what's her name? Your big singer down there? Bayonne, Bayonne, Bayonne. What's the Beyonce. word? What's the, Beyonce. Thank you. I showed you how much pop music I listen to. Beyonce's dad died of, of uh, male breast cancer. Okay, because he had the he had he a bracket. He didn't die. He didn't die. Oh, Richard. Yeah, there he are survived. a lot of male breast cancer people who wish he might have done. Okay. So, <laughs> correct. Thank you for correcting me, and I, 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 that's why it's fun to talk to a group and get the facts right. Uh, he had he has male breast cancer. Uh, and, but if you have a family history of male breast cancer, family history of breast cancer, then you are at increased risk mm-hmm. of prostate cancer. And this is the type of prostate cancer you hear, might have heard about PARB inhibitors. The PARB inhibitors are, are, are drugs that can target this population, but they have a whole variety of bad side effects, or so I believe. And Mark, do you want to say anything about the uh, estradiol pathways and, and prostate cancer and the PARB inhibitors? Do you have anything you might want to add? Uh, I would have no idea. Other than I mean, estrogen stimulates cell division, and every time you stimulate cell division, you have uh, a risk of errors, uh, which then are not able to be repaired. Yeah, but and they, but the, the repair mechanisms are part of the BRCA gene. gene. So that's the problem. Uh, so I, I say if you're going to go on estrogen, you want to make sure that you don't have – the, you're not uh, in that small percentage of people who have uh, estrogen-sensitive cancer mutations. Other questions? I'm going to do something which I, I don't know with the crowd this big. This is one of the larger audience I've talked to. If people have more questions, um, I don't hide my email address. Uh, you're welcome to try to throw my way. I may not be answering them immediately. I'm buried with deadlines right now. Uh, but if you keep them in a way that that there's sort of yes or no questions that helps as opposed to yeah, I, I, think, I think actually we've we've covered pretty much every question that was in the chat box fantastic and and i think you know given what you contributed richard and for those that have future questions i think we can start we certainly have the discussion open at our normal meeting time where we can investigate these issues as an on an individual basis so, so thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'll step in since we, we seem to have covered all the questions and really thank you immensely, Richard. Um, Jake has put in the chat window um, where you'll find the recording on YouTube tomorrow and um, we will also blog it. it we'll, we'll put this, be sure to put this on our ANCAN. Um, a couple of um, Quick thing. One thing I did want to say to you, Richard, is that um, you might want to check with the men in the male breast cancer community about their attitude to tamoxifen. They they loathe it. It dominates their support group conversations. So um, that might be an area that you you want to do a little bit of. I, I am not. I, I I am not a big fan of it. I would, if on estrogen, I would not. With the, knowing what has not been published out of the, the UK on the PATH study. I do not necessarily think it's a great idea to, uh, to uh, take estrogen and uh, tamoxifen. Okay. Um, one thing I just also wanted to mention to everybody is that we will be having a webinar on Wednesday night on inherited mutations. Be talking more about BRCA and Lynch syndrome with some very interesting guests including our board president, Peter Kafka, um, and his son, and uh, also um, Dr. Pamela Munster from the uh, 
UCSF Bracker, uh, Center for BRCA Research and her son, um, she carries a BRCA gene. So um, please come back to us and, and, and um, it won't be on this channel, it'll be on uh, the webinar channel and maybe somebody can can put the uh, can put the, the the link for that in quickly um, in in the chat window. Um, our normal support groups are every week, first and third Mondays, second and fourth Tuesdays. So the next meeting I think is April fifth, if I'm not mistaken, at eight o'clock. Um, and come back in then, and we'll 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 probably have a a, a big uh, group um but we'll be happy to to welcome anybody who's new and um we'll we'll work with you just as as we always do so um i think that's about it anything any uh, the other moderators would like to add just give me a second yeah. here and i'll and i'll put the registration in for um just for want to our... say thank you very much richard yeah. it was very informative i'm sure everyone learned a lot tonight. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I also I also want to take a little extra and thank Mark for his contribution. Oh, I agree. Yes, you too, Mark. Absolutely. Well, I thank learned uh, I learned a heck of a lot tonight, and <laughs> I enjoy when um, we can move beyond and hear from experience and hear the questions. I learn more by hearing the questions uh, often than hearing the answers. Okay, so here's the here's the uh, here's the registration. There we go. Send it to everybody. There's the registration for the webinar. You can click on that, and you'll be able to sign up right <coughs> afterwards. And um, we'll say good night to everybody, and see you on Wednesday. If not on Wednesday, we'll see you next Monday. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, Thanks, everyone.